Hey hey everyone, welcome to the second video of the Illustrated Data Structure series. Today, we're diving into everything you need to know about arrays. We are going to discuss what edges are and how they function. What are some of the limitations, different operations you can perform on an array, and the complexity of those operations. So, what's an array? It's a collection of items stored consecutively in memory. Let's say that we have this representation of the memory, where each block represents a slot in the memory. Now you might have an array of numbers or characters, each placed next to the other in the array. There are two features of an array that you should keep in mind. The first point is that every item in a list must be of the same type, meaning you can't mix characters, numbers and texts. They all need to be uniform. And the second one is that array has to have the fixed size. So for example, if you allocated five items for the array, you can't add the sixth item to it. Let's look at some examples of arrays in C++. Now don't worry if you're not familiar with C++, as the concepts that we will cover in this video, they are same in the other languages. For example, here we have an array of three integers, an array of strings and an array of characters, where each array has a type which specifies the kind of items the array will contain. Then we have the array length, which is the maximum number of items it can hold. And lastly, we have the values or items in the array. Now again, the array that we declare is fixed in size, so you can't allocate more space at the runtime. For instance, if there's an array with three numbers, adding a fourth isn't possible. Also, mixing different types of values in the array is not allowed. So, we can't have an array with characters, strings and numbers all mixed together. You might be asking why these restrictions exist. Let's examine them one by one. Let's say that we have this array of three integers, which we have to represent in the memory. Now what our program is going to do, is it is going to allocate three slots in the memory, and then it will fill in the values in those slots. Since computer memory is not exclusive to us and is also available to other programs, the computer will keep using these memory slots and allocating them for other uses. If we try to add a fourth element to the array later, it becomes an issue. Since our program allocated only three slots for the array, the fourth slot might or might not be available, so the program won't let us fill in the fourth value in the array, and that is why we have arrays of a fixed size, so we must specify their size before using them, allowing the computer to allocate the necessary space. Consecutive memory blocks for the array to be utilized. You might be wondering what prevents us from allocating a very large number for our array. This means we can easily add new numbers to the array whenever needed. The reason you can't do that is because it would mean hogging all those memory slots even when you don't use them. And you won't be letting the other programs which might need those memory slots from using those memory slots. And this will cause the memory leak. Alright, so next we have the case for the mixed types. Why can't we have the arrays with the mixed data types? Before we talk about that, let's look at some of the example data types. Let's say that we have these three different arrays, an array of numbers, an array of true or false values, and an array of letters. Now the size of an integer is two bytes. A boolean value occupies one byte in memory, and a character also uses one byte. Let's say that we have this memory representation, where each block represents one byte in the memory. Imagine having an array of integers that needs to be represented in memory. We understand that every number needs two bytes of space. So the first number, which is four, will use two chunks or two bytes. Nine will occupy two more spaces. And six will fill the final two spaces. Now when it's time to access these array elements from the memory, since our program knows that the array is an array of integers, so it knows to read the first two bytes to get the array's first number. Skip two bytes and read the next two bytes and it will get the second number. Skip four bytes and read the next two bytes and it will get the third number and so on. Now imagine if we had an array with values of different types. We have an integer that occupies two bytes, a three character string taking up three bytes, and a boolean that needs one byte. Now when it's time to read these values from the memory, since this is a list with various types of values, our program can't predict how many bytes are needed to access the first, second or third item. And that's why all the items in an array must be of the same type. Okay, 
You might be curious why these restrictions don't apply in languages like JavaScript, PHP or Ruby. How can we have arrays that are dynamically sized and also support mixed types? And the answer to that is because there is a lot going on behind the scenes to make it work. Let's say we have this array of numbers in JavaScript. It will allocate three blocks and fill them with values in memory. Our program will proceed, utilizing additional memory blocks for other tasks. Later on when we add a new number to the list, it will check if the next space is free for us to use or not. If it's empty, it will allocate space for our array and add the new number to that block. And now if we try to push a new number to that, and let's say that the next memory block, it can't be allocated. In that case, it is going to try and find out some other place in the memory where it can populate the whole array. It is going to find that space and allocate it uh, for the area that we have. Move all the items we have in that area there and free up the previously allocated headspace and push the new item into the newly allocated array space. And that is how these languages can have dynamically sized arrays. Now the next question is about the areas with the mixed type values. Here we have an array with an integer of 2 bytes, a string of 3 bytes and a boolean of 1 byte. How does JavaScript manage to store an array with mixed type values? The answer to that is the limitation of size. So what do we mean by that? In this case JavaScript will find the element with the largest size in the array. Now in this case a string is taking the maximum size of 3 bytes. So it will use 3 bytes and assign 9 bytes in total. One for each array element. Three bytes per element in total for the whole array. So instead of seven bytes, we'll have nine bytes for this whole array. Let's examine a visual to understand better. First up, we have the integer. Instead of allocating two bytes, since the maximum size of element in the array is three bytes, so it is going to allocate three bytes for the integer then 3 bytes for the string and 3 bytes for the boolean. Now when it comes the time to read the values from the memory, it knows that it has kept all the elements to 3 bytes. So it's going to read 3 bytes and get the first element, skip 3 bytes and read the next 3 bytes to get the second element, skip 6 bytes and read the next 3 bytes to get the third element and so on. And that's how it allows elements of different types in the array. Okay. Now that we understand arrays and their mechanics, let's explore the operations we can perform on them and the complexity of these operations. Let's say we have this array of numbers. The item of the areas are indexed starting from zero till the end. And we use this index to read the elements from the array. So for example, to read the first element of the array, we will write numbers of the array, 0. And we will get the first number. And to read the fifth element of the array, we will write numbers of 5 and so on. And the complexity of reading an element from the array is constant complexity. There is all for 1. We will not be discussing how the complexity is calculated in this video. Uh, there is a video that dives deeper into complexity analysis on this channel. Don't forget to watch it. Uh, we have inserting an element at an index. Let's say that we have the same array and we need to insert an element 3 at index 2. Now what it will do is, starting from index 2, push all the items to the right to make space for the element to be inserted. And once it has the space, it will push the element 3 to the index 2. The complexity of this process will be linear, that is the order of n. Next we'll discuss removing an element from the array. Suppose we want to eliminate the element at index 2. We will simply remove the element and pull back each of the remaining elements in the array. The algorithmic complexity of deleting an element is also linear, i.e. O of n. Next we have the updating of the value at an index. Now this one is quite simple. All we have to do is just replace the value at the index and the algorithmic complexity of updating a value is also constant. That is O of 1. And finally we have traversing the array which means simply visiting each element of the array. The time it takes to go through the array is obviously proportional to the number of elements. And, uh, and that's everything about arrays. In our next video, we'll explore linked lists. So be sure to subscribe and I'll see you then.